And so when a patient has to have a bowel movement, we would cover the bedpan with a sterile towel and run to the door. And sitting out in the hall on wooden benches would be pit medical students. That was their primary job, was to grab that bedpan and have it down in the lab, probably within a minute or two. And that's where Dr. Salk isolated the live polio virus from a young male patient at Municipal Hospital. This was the job that prominent researchers, prominent virologists would not do. It was scut work, it was hard work, it was uninteresting work. But what Jonas Salk intuitively understood was that it was the kind of work that would get him on the March of Dimes bandwagon. After three painstaking years, Salk confirmed that there were indeed only three types of polio virus. He secured a contract to develop a vaccine. He was the miracle worker in the white coat on the one hand, but he was also an incredibly hard-working, devoted scientist for whom people were willing to sacrifice. And Jonas Salk at the University of Pittsburgh put together an extraordinary team of researchers. And what Salk did was sort of direct this team and whip this team and move it in a single direction. And that direction was to put out a polio vaccine as quickly as possible. As funding grew, Salk expanded his lab from two rooms to more than two floors. The space even housed mice and monkeys, used in a variety of ways during the typing and vaccine creation. We had our own animal colonies on the second floor. We had rhesus monkeys and then later on cinnamogus monkeys. And by the way, we made all our own food for the monkeys. That food was made in our basement in vitamins and supplements that we purchased. The monkeys would wake up at 6 a.m. and they would grab their food pans and they would clang them against the bars of their cages. What a racket! And we would look at each other and smile and say, we have one hour to go. You know, so we called it monkey time. <laughs> Salk was working on a radical idea. Vaccines work by giving the body tiny doses of a disease, which leads to the creation of antibodies that provide immunity. The conventional wisdom was that the best vaccines needed to contain a live virus. But Salk believed a polio vaccine could use a dead virus to produce an effective immune response. It wasn't an unprecedented idea, but it certainly wasn't accepted science. He was challenging medical orthodoxy. All of the ordained ministers of virology said, you have to have a live virus in the vaccine to stop polio. And this Jonas kept saying, no, I think we can fake the body into manufacturing these protective antibodies by giving them killed vaccine. Jonas Salk and his team had to figure out a way to take three types of polio virus and to kill it with formaldehyde, but to kill it in such a way that it could still be juiced up to trick your immune system into producing antibodies. Salk wanted a vaccine that was effective, but also safe. Decades earlier, trials of prototype polio vaccines had ended in disaster and dead children. That was a horribly flawed concept and resulted in a horribly flawed vaccine that caused polio in some children. So this was the mid-1930s, and I think it casts a pall over polio research for a solid 20 years. And because you knew that in the mid-1930s, there were researchers that gave a polio vaccine that caused polio. The first attempt with an inactivated polio vaccine killed kids. So the way was clear what not to do, in a sense. Salk believed the dead virus vaccine was the safest approach. He loved the idea. It's like, God, if you can prevent people from getting a disease without putting them at risk, why not? And it was, you know, there was a certain sort of humane spirit to it. 
it was enlightened. And this was very, very big pioneering stuff in terms of how vaccination became a common sense thing. But as with all pioneering ideas, criticism often follows. Salk's most vocal opponent was Dr Albert Sabin, a virologist in Cincinnati. Albert Sabin was the vaccine orthodoxy, and I think he poo-pooed Salk because he felt that Salk's notion of, of taking a polio virus and completely inactivating it with formaldehyde as a way to make a lifelong vaccine was ridiculous. The problem, however, was that Sabin had an enormous amount of influence, and partly because he was very good at, at inserting himself among those who shared his belief, which were the big virologists at the time. Jonas was the one who fought all those outside battles. He fought the immunization committee that was almost unanimously opposed to a killed vaccine, with Sabin leading the charge. Sabin was working on his own polio vaccine, using the live virus. And what you have are very competent, very ambitious, very competitive scientists in a kind of frantic race, although they deny they're in a race, they're fully in a race. Dr. Sabin came to the lab once, and he sort of looked over my shoulder. He said, huh, you won't be doing that next month. So he was very negative, let's say. It was David and Goliath, the elite establishment scientist with all the allies, versus the younger man in a working class town with the radical new approach. It was the rivalry of a lifetime, with the lives of children at stake. But Sabin did have legitimate scientific questions about Salk's approach to the vaccine. There were several concerns about the killed vaccine. One is, would it induce long-term, lifelong immunity? Obviously, when you start with a vaccine, you don't know that. Most experts believed the key to lasting immunity was to create a low-grade natural infection in the body, something they thought a dead virus couldn't do. And that wasn't the only objection. All our vaccines, with the exception of tetanus, work two ways. One is individual protection, which is, of course, not 100%. And then the other is what's called herd immunity. If you vaccinate enough people, you protect those who can't be vaccinated for one reason or another. When a large population is injected with a vaccine, it can prevent a small outbreak from becoming an epidemic. With a live virus vaccine, there is an added bonus. Recipients shed minute amounts of the still living virus, which can be passed on to other people. This passive vaccination makes yet more people immune. Sabin believed that while the dead virus vaccine would protect an individual, the live virus vaccine would provide wider protection. The March of Dimes funded both Salk and Sabin in an effort to find a vaccine as soon as possible. Salk not only believed his approach was the best, but also that his vaccine could be produced more quickly. The man who made all this research possible was the president of the March of Dimes. His name was Basil O'Connor. O'Connor was a close friend, a law associate of FDR. My dad learned a tremendous amount from O'Connor about how to get things done in the world, about how boards run, how to get things politically through. Basil O'Connor had complete and total confidence in what we were doing. The one man now, who isn't even a scientist or an MD, was really making the decisions for our work to continue to go on. The stakes couldn't be higher. Every day that it took to make that vaccine was a day that some children around the United States got polio. And kids are dying every year. And as Basil O'Connor, head of the National Foundation, says, this is a scientist who sees beyond the microscope. 
we didn't have to uh, really be stimulated very much by what was going on around us because up on the third floor was the polio ward where they had all the iron lungs. So all you had to do was go and look in there and you didn't need much more incentive. Jonas said that he, at one time he felt like he was riding a horse and being whipped all the time because <laughs> O'Connor wanted to get it done, get it done. Jonas says, we're talking about a vaccine. I don't even know if we have a vaccine. I'm talking about an experimental preparation. O'Connor says, to him, Jonas, you have a vaccine and we got to use it. There's no sense of saying it's five years away or 10 years away. Let's get moving and have it sooner rather than later. The team raced ahead. By 1951, Salk was ready to test some experimental vaccines on humans a trial that would cause him many sleepless nights. The subjects would be 43 patients at the D.T. Watson Home for Crippled Children, run by Dr. Jesse Wright. The Watson Home were all kids who had polio. So in some sense, there's less risk involved. And so Dr. Jesse Wright worked with my father and courageously allowed her kids at that institution to be the first to receive the vaccine. The children wouldn't be cured by the vaccine. But because they'd already had polio, they couldn't contract the disease a second time. It was a brilliant safety measure, if the families would agree. These are a group of people that were very visionary. They knew that they suffered and they wanted to help other people not suffer. And the people that were ahead of watching home explained this to the kids that, hey, what we're trying is something new it's going to help other people. It may not help you, but the children all knew it, and the parents of the children were all for it, too. And I thought, oh boy, this is great. I'm going to get the shot, I'm going to be able to run around and walk again and go play ball. The doctor said, no, <laughs> it's not going to prevent what happened. It's going to prevent it to happening to other people, like your brother. I said, fine. Salk took a blood sample from each child, then gave them the injection. A few weeks later, blood was drawn again. If the new sample showed increased antibodies, Salk would know the vaccine worked. Is he nervous when he begins human testing? Of course he's nervous. He literally goes to those places every night to see how the kids are doing. But they had tremendous faith in Jonas Salk. He was a father. He tested the vaccine on himself. He tested the vaccine on his children. I asked Donna, his wife, she says, oh yeah, he, got, he, gives, he gave the kids the shots, and they screamed. <laughs> There's a picture of me getting a vaccination that's clearly a setup shot. I mean, it's, it's just a wonderful quintessential 50s photograph. I mean, it wasn't fair to go ask other people to take the vaccine when we didn't take it ourselves. So we vaccinated one another, we vaccinated our children, before we went to the world. Weeks later, and the data was in. The experiment had worked. He knew that it was possible to immunize humans effectively with this inactivated preparation. That broke the orthodoxy, frankly, that was established by the leading virologists at the time. And, and he was, in that sense, a good decade ahead of his time. And he proved it. And still people didn't believe it. After Salk ran successful tests in the Watson School, the March of Dimes felt that he was going to have to run a small study in the schools in and surrounding Pittsburgh. Testing on children with polio was one thing, but now it was time to inject healthy ones. In February 1954, Pittsburgh enrolled 7,500 of their own children to receive the first injections. Once the word started getting around about some progress being made, there was no lack of volunteers. Parents were willing to turn their kids right over. They were convinced long before Salt, this is going to work, this is it. And I think there was a tremendous pride that it was being done in their city, with their money, involving people in their community. 
who what is just amazing is how easy Salk found it, not only to round up the 7,500 kids, but to round up pediatricians who are willing to give the shots, nurses who are willing to stand by, people who are willing to chauffeur these kids back and forth, record keeping.